I'm here with Hiram today. Hello. You may know him from Skincare by Hiram. He is an amazing YouTuber. I'm gonna drop his link below. Hiram, thank you for coming on and agreeing to be interviewed. Oh my gosh, of course. Literally, like, I wanted to make this happen so badly because I have been binge watching your content nonstop. I am one of those subscribers that's like, Okay, when's she gonna post next? <laughs> like I'm waiting on the next posting date. And um, I'm so glad we get to like be in person, you know, I like know. together. It's so unexpected, but thank you so much for having me on your channel. Yes. It's really special. Uh, Hiram texted me a few days ago and he's from Hawaii. I live in Texas and his layover, he was able to work it out to have a layover in Austin, yes. which is so cool. Tonight we're going to go grab some oysters. Do you like yeah. oysters? Oh, yes. Oh, oh my gosh. God. Seafood. This is, is why we're friend, yeah. already friends. <laughs> yeah. So grab some drinks. Uh, but first we got to have our chat. <laughs> yes, we do. Which I'm really excited about because I've been wanting to like I don't know, hear your opinions, stances, and just your thoughts on uh, just your story, but also my story too. I don't know, I feel like we have a lot to talk about, so I'm stoked. Yeah, super excited. I know you were raised Mormon. Mm -hmm. Obviously I was too. Were, I mean, was your upbringing, would you say, hyper devout and religious, or were you more of one of those nuanced Mormons that we hear about, but don't often See. actually meet? <laughs> I know. I'm like, they're almost elusive. I'm like, I hear about them, but I have yet to meet one. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I was raised extremely devout to the level that it's so interesting whenever people would say, oh, like Mormonism is a cult. Like I would always hear that growing up and I'm like, no, it's not. And then I watch cult documentaries and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is how I was raised. Like I'm drawing so many parallels. Like the devoutness was next level, I would say in my environment. Before we jump in, I am so excited to announce this week's video sponsor, My Heritage. As you all know, I've been jumping into my family history a lot lately, and I only found out a few months ago that I have several generations of polygamy in my immediate family. This newfound obsession is why I chose to partner with My Heritage. The test was super quick to take, and I really appreciated how easy it was to understand the instructions. My Heritage can help you build your family tree and helps you get access to over 20 billion historical records and documents. Documents. My results just came in and I'm so excited to see what they say. I'm guessing my heritage will be mostly European because I think most of my ancestors were from England, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> okay, I was wrong. My biggest ethnicity result is Scandinavian. I'm 63% Scandinavian, 28% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh and 4% Greek and South Italian, and my my smallest one is 3.8% Balkan. Also fascinating, it can tell that my genetic group is from Mormons in Utah, Idaho, California, Arizona, Wyoming, and in Colorado. My heritage also allows me to see DNA matches so I can see close family, extended family, and distant relatives. My heritage has a promotion right now. You can click the link in the description box or scan this QR code. Make sure to use this coupon code to get free shipping. My parents created an environment where everything was linked to some divine purpose, to, to you know, Heavenly Father in some way, whether it's spiritual related topics or the most minute things of like day-to-day -day activities. You know, you hear about yeah. like the, the Mormons when they're shopping and doing their daily activities and always utilizing like prayer and what would Heavenly Father want? Like that was definitely the type of environment that I was in, which was overwhelming to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds very similar. I, I mean, feel it was like, the same for you. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, all, I feel like so many of my early memories are just so Mormon coded mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> where, you know, even just thinking about our massive food storage <laughs> pantry, <laughs> the fact Wait, that- I forgot about that. Oh my gosh, we did too. <laughs> like a whole basement with just like cans and cans everywhere. And finding out that that's not normal. Mm -hmm. Like when I've talked about it on TikTok videos, people will be like, well, everyone has a pantry. I'm like, no. You're like, no, no, no. It's not a pantry. Totally different. <laughs> <laughs> it's the apocalypse room. It's kind of crazy. Like your family had like, a huge food storage area. Yeah, and we, I mean, I feel like so many, speaking of prayer, just like memories growing up of just the most random little things where we'd be grocery shopping and my sister once fell out of the grocery cart 
And I remember just how many conversations we had about how the Lord had intervened and, you know, that we, we all said prayers that night and just basically whether it was finding card keys or <laughs> hospital visits or getting a priesthood blessing, it's just so, or just going to church all the time. <laughs> it's very interwoven. Would you say you were, sounds like you weren't really drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know what? I really didn't. And that's something that I'm very grateful for. But growing up, I felt very isolated about, I think, you know, from a very early age, I, you know, hi everyone, I'm gay. Um, <laughs> I recognized that I was gay what? very early. I know, who would have thought? <laughs> you know, I recognized that so early on because practically, you know, once I exited the womb, you're being told this message of like, you're going to get married in the temple. You're going to find a yeah. woman, you know, you're going to, and I remember from a super young age, just being like, that is not what I want. That's not what I'm about before I could even conceptualize like sexuality or attraction. Um, I recognized that early on. So I definitely did not drink the Kool-Aid. I weirdly enough, never had a testimony. Okay. Um, I, viewed the church from a very logical perspective. Um, but because I wasn't really fully engulfed in the messaging of the church, it definitely made it very isolating to where I was like, okay, something's wrong with me. Like I can't get a testimony. I have no idea why I don't believe in any of this. Something must be wrong. But now I'm very grateful for that because I think yeah. I'm learning your testimony or like, you know, grappling with the aftermath of having one is really difficult. Yeah, it sounds kind of like if you already know you're gay or like you maybe you just have feelings like something isn't jiving with the messaging, you're kind of already getting, like you, your baseline is distrust of mm -hmm. the message, which like you said, isolating, but also kind of nice because you don't have to build up all of these belief systems yes. that then you have to deconstruct. Um, yep. I feel like when I was hearing all these messages, like I, my favorite movie when I was a kid was Mulan. Mm, and wow. Mulan is for the feminists. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, she goes, she fights with the men. She's the best warrior. Yeah. At the end, everyone bows down, you know. I'm such a badass. Mm. So I think my experience was more having this urge to do all of these male mm -hmm. boy things, but knowing it was wrong. Yeah to feel that way and feel guilty about it. Which sucks because within the church, it's already such a patriarchal system where men hold all the power, let alone in a home environment where that message is kind of being like perpetuated to you of like, you know, uh, you're a girl, but I wanted a boy and you know, all that. I can imagine yeah. that would really like push you to like kind of fight against that. But also the, in contrast to truly believing in the church, which, you know, I've watched a bunch of your videos. I've heard your story, you know, at, at um, many times and I, I love hearing it every time. But um, I mean, you really did like fully have a testimony. We're very convicted. In, in yes, the I was drinking mm -hmm. every cup of Kool-Aid. Guzzling the Kool-Aid, yes. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, I think it was like hitting my dope. Like it was like a dopamine hit mm -hmm. every time that I could do something more mini because it felt like so aligned with what I felt like a good person should be and do. Mm -hmm. When would you say is your earliest memory of like realizing you were gay, mm -hmm. like fully, you know, not yeah. just like something's different, mm -hmm. but that you had a realization? Yeah, I mean, I definitely had like, you know, inklings at any time, like, you know, the temple marriage was brought up. Um, I think I more fully accepted it when I was like in middle school, high school, because, you know, even the way that Mormonism portrays homosexuality today, you know, it's not being gay, it's SSA, you know, same sex attraction. They talk about it like it's a cancer or a disease. Um, and so, you know, for a while I did have that kind of um, perspective where I was able to dissociate from that a little bit and be like, well, that's the, that's the sinful side of me. That's not me, me, you mm -hmm. know? And I think it was when I was in high school that I was able to fully grapple with like, no, I'm, Oh, no. <laughs> full, fully through. Um, Man, I, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I feel like from lots of stories I've heard that at the beginning of that grappling, mm -hmm. it's kind of excruciating mm -hmm. because you want so badly to just erase it or remove it. Mm -hmm. And because you feel like it's a sin mm -hmm. and when it doesn't go away. Oh, yeah. 
y- you know, I don't know Torture. what that was like for you. Oh, I mean, it's it's the main thing you pray about. It's the main thing that you're thinking about. Just the constant like pleading and begging with Heavenly Father to be like, please don't make me gay. Like, please take this away. You know, just feeling like you're. And then the the isolation that you feel from other church members, let alone, you know, family dynamics, because you're like, you're automatically kind of tainted, stained in a way. And it's hard to feel like you can really connect or relate to other people in the church or in your family when that message is being so shoved down your throat. And I feel like, you know, a, a lot of people like to separate the doctrine from the culture, which really, really bugs me um, because, uh, you know, the the doctrine of the church is very staunch on its position on homosexuality. There are some gay active Mormons Mm -hmm. who are kind of saying, hey, we can be part of this church and Mm -hmm. be gay. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a really fraught message Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's true. The doctrine, especially if you look at all the quotes Mm -hmm. from all the prophets over years, over years, over years, decades and decades of just describing being homosexual as one of the worst sins Mm -hmm. imaginable. And there's even like a talk given at BYU, I think in the the 60s, where he basically says that it's better if you just get up and leave the campus and never come back Mm -hmm. than be gay at BYU. And that's, it's such a, it's so horrible. They would search for people. They would go to uh, gay bars and do license plate scans. Yeah, it was a full witch hunt, gay witch hunt, basically. Mm And I mean, m- multiple BYU students have committed suicide oh, yeah. for yeah. and Absolutely. because they were gay. So I mean, I think for a kid too to navigate that mm-hmm. and have to have all of this messaging and know from such a young age that it's wrong and be pushing up against this barrier. Like I still feel it. I still feel it. But I can't tell any trusted adult in my life. Yep. Yeah. Is, you can't tell tell anyone. I remember I made the mistake when I was in high school of um, telling my bishop, you know, not not in full, but I, where I'm just like, oh, like I'm feeling like this, you know, attractive feelings to other men. And for a long time, I had been like um, his, the babysitter for his kids. Like I was their family babysitter. You know, I did babysitting a lot growing up. And I'll never forget after that interview, he was not about that happening. He whenever I was like with the kids, even in like social environments, like he had to be there like watching. I'm just like, wow, like you really can't tell anyone. And the thing, the really harmful thing about it is that, you know, being gay in this world is already difficult enough navigating cultural norms and, you know, biases that society as a whole has. But because Mormonism is so interwined with, you know, like, family, community, um, so many different aspects of the Mormon church are so, it's like a codependent relationship almost, you (laughs) know, that not only do you have to grapple with potentially being rejected by society, but you also have to grapple with the idea of like, I'm going to have my family, my community, everything that I've known and loved and been surrounded with can be taken away in a second just for being who you are, you know? So it's a lot of pressure to put on a kid and why so many you know, um, LGBT plus kids are so, you know, suicidal and stuff because it really is so It's very, I mean, it's a very life or death, Mm -hmm. just like uh, equation, because on the one side you have this thing about yourself being gay. And then on the other side, you have literally everything else in your life, Mm -hmm. your family, community, religious beliefs, your future, you know, uh, that what a thing to have to balance Mm -hmm. the scales as a kid to have to weigh it, it is kind of better, I think, in their imaginations, like in their in their calculation. Mm-hmm. Maybe it is better to just not be alive, mm-hmm. not because that's true, but because I think when you're 14, mm-hmm. you don't you don't want those feelings. You probably just want your family to love you. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that, that continues into adulthood. In so many cases, I don't know if you've seen the show that's been going really viral. Yes, um, my husband's not gay. Yeah, TikTok from like but yeah. it was a TLC show a while ago, right? Yeah, but like now in 2016 it's or something. Newly like that. viral, basically. Yeah. My my husband's not gay. The whole premise of it is like Mormon men who are in marriage with a woman, but you know 
kind of coming to terms with their SSA, you know, same sex attraction and navigating a relationship where the wife is kind of. They're basically trying to make it seem like the wife and the husband are best friends mm -hmm. and they're just co-supporting each other. It's never, I've never, I haven't seen the whole show, but I think and usually in relationships like this, it's inferred they're, they're not sleeping together. Mm -hmm. They just, or may, sometimes they have kids though. So oh, may, yeah. maybe they have I like- I usually know people once, in that situation, like fully gay, not come to terms with it, have kids in a relationship. Like it's, it hits a nerve, a very accurate nerve, I think. It's so, I mean, and how, un, it's like so unfair to everyone involved. Mm -hmm. And sometimes bishops will actively counsel gay men to marry yeah. women, to, to cure them. <sighs> Yeah. And basically like, oh, if you just, you know, if you just turn it off to use the Book of Mormon musical line, yes. if you just turn it off for long enough, mm -hmm. it really will go away. And that, you know, to the, the psychological impact of spending your entire life like that, mm -hmm. whether you're the woman or the man or the kids, mm -hmm. is just how, how dark this doctrine can go that they force entire families down that path. Exactly, exactly. Leading to just so much destruction down the road. And, you know, it's it's definitely like so difficult for, you know, members who are part of the LGBT community. But that I think just illustrates just how harmful the doctrine is in general, because whether you're straight or not, with Mormonism, there's an expectation that everything in your life has to be centered around it. So whether it's, you know, like the youth group nights or, you know, the the social engagements during the week, spending, you know, who knows how many hours at church on Sunday, the social interactions, like the goal is to really intertwine your life with the church so much that if you do feel like you're leaving, you know, or you're growing distance from it, you, you feel like you're losing everything. So I just feel like across the board, it's, I don't know, that's the environment I definitely was raised in um, with, with my family. I can't even imagine having that in the back of your mind, but then going to church and having comments be said, because yep. we have to say there's the doctrine that is saying being gay is wrong, mm -hmm. but then there is definitely comments from members yes. that are ultra homophobic. I mean, yep. the, even the babysitting story you told. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the, it's what's being taught at the pulpit, but it's also all just like the random homophobic stuff that yeah. members say kind of continuously. The doctrine and internal prejudice makes such an intense toxic combination where that's why, you know, whenever people say, well, you know, doctrine versus culture, I'm like, no, doctrine inspires prejudice to just flourish and become so much more intense than what the letter of the law says. So, you know, the amount of comments I would hear growing up where it's like, you know, oh, like, I think all the homosexuals should be killed or, you know, like I, you know, it's, it's worse than, you know, like so many off things worse than murder. Like anyone who's that way should just like kill themselves. You know, these horrible, horrible things that you're constantly hearing growing up. I think for me, I, because I recognized it so early on, at least that inkling of like, I don't want to get married to a woman. I know that's not how I'm wired and something's off. I feel like I approached my relationship to the church as kind of like the the greatest acting role of all time <laughs> where I and so honestly great. I could have won an Academy Award winning you know award for my performance because I feel like I did such a good job at playing up the perfect Mormon kid like I was the star student you know in like all the um whether it's like youth groups or Sunday school lessons. Um, I, even like when I was in high school, I was in um, missionary training prep mm -hmm. and I was like the one that they would, uh, that missionaries would take out, you know, proselyting and like help teach the lessons. Like in every capacity, I really committed to this role of like fake it to make it, you know, kind yeah. of thing where it's like, well, if I don't feel this way, then I'm going to put as much energy into it so that I will be able to have a testimony so that I won't mm. be gay anymore. Um, it was like full on pray the gay away yes, approach. Yes, exactly. <laughs> when And how old were you when you told your bishop? I was, I think I was 17 years old at that time. Yeah. I okay. Six, so, six so you were kind of preparing, preparing for a mission. 
Because, yes. boys, you probably would have still had the age of, what was it, 19? Or had they changed it? Uh, it was you? 19. Okay. I think they changed okay. it to 18, like, shortly afterwards. But, yes, like, I was preparing to serve a mission. <laughs> serve. But... <laughs> serve a mission, a.k.a. Serve. <laughs> <laughs> um. Go be on your high horse and tell other people they're wrong about everything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know what's so funny? Growing up, I just remember the internal dread I felt at the thought of serving a mission. I was like, that is so not something I want to do. But, you know, I was still heavily involved. To be honest with the family dynamic I had, I, I kind of had no other option but to be heavily involved in everything, missionary training prep, all of that. Um, and so um, I remember when I was going out with missionaries and, you know, kind of seeing what that process was like, definitely getting confirmation that like, okay, this is so not what I believed in. Which for context, boys are so shepherded into missionary work. I mean, that is, to me, it's one of the most uh, mind controlling aspects of Mormonism is how much they push young boys into being missionaries for two, two full-time years, 24 seven, leaving your family, knocking on doors, Two years is a lot of your life. Mm -hmm. You're also now at 18 going. So you're basically skipping straight from your hyper religious family straight into your hyper religious mission. So you basically, as a Mormon boy now, you don't see the real world you don't, till yeah. you're 20. Yeah, which is <laughs> You have crazy. where you like finally have your own time, your own apartment, potentially your own money, your own ability to get a job because missionaries aren't paid. Yep. You pay yep. to serve a mission. Just so to, yeah to get out of the bubble and i feel like it's very dependent obviously on like where you live but i know for me my community and my family it was such a heavy bubble where like there wasn't a lot of like arizona i don't think yeah. people understand how mormon arizona is it's so mormon it's like, <laughs> it's like utah insane, yeah. idaho arizona yeah so mormon yeah and i like lived way out in the boonies in the country tiny tiny town you know i grew up grew up on a cattle ranch so like you're dealing with a very mormon bubble combined with people who really have never seen the outside world most people that i knew had never left the state let alone like crazy you know the country or anything so it's a very limited worldview so you really are raised in this this bubble where you don't understand the real world at all and like you were saying before that pressure that young men face to go on a mission it is spoon fed to you from day one to the point that like in a way you're like if i don't go on a mission i'm exiled like i yeah. am so looked down upon it's yes. like i committed the worst sin it's such a huge no-no that most of the people i knew who did go on a mission i was like i can tell y'all don't want to go y'all have no yeah desire to do this, i mean even the most religious Mormon guy, like, who wants to leave their family for two years and pay to do door-to-door -door sales? Hey, they're not getting paid. <laughs> You're paying to do it. That is such, that is so mind-blowing to me that, that we've normalized paying for that. Yes. When the church has more than $230 billion, yeah. um, yeah. You're paying to go do sales for the church. And growing up, we had so many activities where, like, I have, I have memories maybe being eight, nine years old, making little missionary tags. Mm -hmm. And you put mm -hmm. it on your little pet lapel and you're, I hope they call me. And there's a, a song that you sing in oh, primary. I forgot about that song. I no. hope they call me on like, mission. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's, yeah. you're singing that, what, I think you start going to primary three, four, five. So... Mm -hmm you are indoctrinated from birth to want to go to the temple, yep. to do temple ceremonies, to want to serve a mission. They would say, boys, for us girls, they would say, you should never, you know, you should not marry a man who did not serve a mission. Mm -hmm. So the wives are basically dangled in front of the boys, yeah. not for you. Yeah, not for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as basically like, if you don't serve a mission, you will not get married to a Mormon girl and girls are taught never date a boy for marriage unless he served a mission. Mm -hmm. And I even have in my journals that I won't sir, I won't marry a Mormon boy if he came home early from mm -hmm. his mission. So even if you get out there and you're living in like a horrible situation, you're having like I, a lot of boys lose like 50 pounds. Yeah. 
They don't protect them. They don't take care of them. Literally, like I'm like, these kids have not even like lived on their own. They don't understand things like, you know, bills and, you know, personal safety. They've, they've yeah, at least for guys, I know like the ages have changed, yes. you know, over the years, but um, for a lot of guys, it was just like straight after high school they're going into yep. a mission with no like real world experience and into these dangerous environments. And it's so weird because like, I remember <laughs> these really traumatizing incidents that were so commonplace on missions. When missionaries would come like back home and tell these stories, it was like they had a social reward um, of being seen as like so spiritual and yeah. so impressive that deepened with the more and more dangerous and like scary the stories got and thinking back on it i'm like why did we praise these young men for what sounds like really genuinely traumatizing experience or neglectful yeah. neglect traumatizing for the, the boy the boys and young girls or young women or whatever like traumatizing for the missionaries but also like horrible for the cultures they're going into mm -hmm. total mm -hmm. colonization total, total you know there's so many stories of of young missionaries encouraging people who don't have running water or electricity to pay 10% of their income to the church, to oh. this random American church that's wealthy beyond any imagination. Yeah. And yeah. so it's really just horrible all the way around. And I think the way that they get the young people to do it is by all of these carrots, by mm -hmm. saying, this is how you get your wife. This is how you will get a calling in the church someday. Yeah. Let alone like the cultural pressure that you feel. Yeah. And I'm so, so <laughs> glad I did not go on one. And I respect people. You're who very did. smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost, it reminds me, I was talking to someone, um, his name is Dan Barlow. Subscribe because the interview with him is coming up. He was kicked out of his home as an ex FLDS member for watching a movie. And oh gosh, he was kind of sharing almost a similar sentiment where like, there's this horrible thing that happened to him getting kicked out or realizing you're gay, but it almost saves you from becoming more deeply part of the cult. Yep. And so I think it's it's like its own tender mercy. Literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Use, tender mercy is a very Mormon term. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man, these, these term, this terminology that you use- It just I'm feels like, so oh, natural. Oh, it's crazy, yeah. <laughs> just two Mormons talking. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly, like I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And you know, like if I was able to talk to my younger self, I would like genuinely tell like that kid, just like, just hold on because I promise you're not the crazy one. You're you're thinking completely rationally, completely logically about all of this. And it's your environment that you're in that's such a bubble. And once you go into the outside world, you'll realize like how unnatural, not normal this is and how, you know, insane some of like the, the cultural and doctrine aspects of it are. It really can be, in my opinion, a lifeline yeah. to yeah. just hear someone say like, I thought I was the worst person on earth, but actually I just needed to get away and escape from mm -hmm. this religion I was being raised in, so. And that's truly what's so incredible about your content. And I applaud you so much for like what you do because really like I, I mean, I was raised in such a bubble that like, I, I didn't really fully understand like, I would say the internet, you know? Um, I, did you out. still have the <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah. <laughs> for the majority. I mean, in the sense that like I didn't I had a T9 cell phone, well, shared between my sibling and I um, up until like through the first semester of college. I didn't even okay. like have like a wow. smartphone. So like any computer access was heavily monitored, very much like, you know, watchful eye. Yes. So I didn't really get the opportunity to kind of explore and see the stories. Um, but nowadays I, that it's so much more accessible. Now the TikTok like. algorithm just delivers it. Yeah, too. it does. I mean, it's kind of wild to see how many Mormons do end up, I think, watching, especially younger Mormons watching on TikTok mm -hmm. and who come in in the comments and will say something. And I'm like, man, like it's, I, I feel like I'm just like, just wait. Mm -hmm. Just wait a few years. You're going to remember that you commented this. And for a lot of them, they're going to leave. I mean, I think it's like 50% is what they estimate for is millennials. Wow. One out of every two will leave. I'm sure it'll be more for Gen Z. Oh, yeah. So, sure. I mean, Gen Z seems even smarter than millennials. In my oh, definitely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are you kidding? Like, <laughs> yeah. And such a, uh, you know, equal rights 
um, focused generation, I feel like. Yeah, too, they're much more... to the dismay of the church. I mean, I don't think I knew about gay people till mm-hmm. I was probably 15 or 16. I think Brokeback Mountain, <gasps> the movie, what I the definitely movie? didn't okay. see it, you okay, know, yeah, as a yeah, Mormon yeah. kid. Yeah. Never would have been allowed to see that. Yeah. It's one of my first memories of a member of the church basically saying, this movie is about that mm-hmm. and we are we are really against that. Mm-hmm. And I remember just seeing Brokeback Mountain, like the movie at Blockbuster, cause mm-hmm. Blockbuster was still a thing mm-hmm. and looking at the cover and I saw it's just two dudes. I don't think they're just, they're don't, they're not kissing on the cover. No, no. It's just two dudes. And I just remember staring at it and just being like, what's wrong with this? <laughs> like, I can't just trying so hard. Like she had said, this movie is really, really bad. Mm-hmm. And trying so hard to just like look and stare and she'd be like, what's wrong with two men on the cover of a movie? Yeah. And I couldn't figure it out. So oh, it's so interesting. Thing. I remember in a video that you did with your husband, I believe you were talking about like how you had a very one track minded perspective towards like um, gay people and gay rights and that he kind of helped to inspire you to think like a little bit outside of the box in that Definitely. perspective. And that's I loved hearing your thought process because that's really, I think, how I was able to disconnect my individuality from the church is you know, we're taught these things and it's so easy to just pick it up and be like, okay, that's the truth. That's what I believe. I'm automatically, you know, I automatically believe this without doing any type of critical questioning or critical thinking about it. And for me, definitely the most significant moments were when I was able to have that introspection and be like, but why? Like, let's delve into this. Why Why is loving someone who's the same gender as you? Like, what about it is so evil? Like, Yeah. You know, how how is it different? You know, each of those moments with the doctrine is when at least I was able to be like, okay, no, this is, this is what I'm being told. This is not innately what I believe. You know, I don't know if that's the same for you. Yes. I, I, uh, I had a few conversations with my husband early on where, uh, he just totally, he really confronted me about my bigotry, obviously, but He, you know, I don't even think he really approached it because he was still Mormon. He had just been home from a mission. I think he also still probably somewhat believed being gay was a sin, Mm -hmm. but he also said our religious beliefs shouldn't dictate how other people in the country live. And that was the line in the sand that I think he drew that really made me start thinking. Mm -hmm. And then that was the same year. I remember another big moment for me was the, there is a Macklemore song. Oh, same same love. love. Yeah. And that came out the year I left the church. And I, I love that song. It's just a great song, but also the lyrics are very, they're very logical. I mean, just, he's basically saying paraphrasing a book written 3,500 years ago why are we saying this is wrong kind of like what you're saying where if you just bring it down to logic and reason Mm -hmm. uh it it's very hard to find true bad with people being gay because they're also amazing people Mm -hmm. they're just they're adults in consensual relationships and the only reason you have for thinking it's a sin is because this religion has has told you but when you meet gay people they're sweet and loving Mm -hmm. and kind and human Mm -hmm. and so i think that that year was also the year that some members of the basically gay straight alliance of byu Mm -hmm. came to speak to us the same love song, the conversations with my husband. And then that was also the year that they said that if your parents were gay, you're not allowed to get baptized. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, I got goosebumps. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Which so many people left when that happened. Mormons believe that the children shouldn't have the sins of the parents on their head. Like that's a kind of like a fundamental belief. And so this idea that the child is by default sinful because the parents are gay. And there's no rule about rapists, kids getting baptized, murderers, kids getting baptized. They have no other limiter on any other sin other than being gay. And that was also, I remember just laying in bed that night after that policy came out and just thinking like, maybe it's not true. Mm -hmm, Like it's mm -hmm. just, that was the year that those thoughts were coming up more and more. I'm just like, like if we're the good, we're the righteous ones and this is what we're, we're teaching. This is what we're putting out there into the world. And it just felt like I can't, 
I can't believe this. Yep. If this, if I'm being told that this bad is good. Mm -hmm. I, so now that you say that, I really remember that impacting me so much too, because I, I think. Were you still in at that point? I was going to BYU Hawaii. So, okay. you know, okay. and the requirement is that you still have to go to church every Sunday. You have your religion classes, which when I say religion, it's just Mormon doctrine, basically not studying other religions at all. Yeah, I remember I was very altruistic and I was like, I, you know, never want to speak badly about the church. I will never call myself like an ex-Mormon or anti-Mormon or, you know, subscribe to any of that. And I just, you know, want to have like a peaceful relationship with it. And I remember when that doctrine came out and I was like, whoa, OK, wait a second. This is so different than the church, you know, just not endorsing homosexuality, this is actively fighting against it within the church. And I remember that was a huge wake up moment for me too, because I remember going to church um, and they were, you know, speaking about that uh, revised doctrine and um, just sitting there and feeling so angry and just being like, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is so fundamentally against everything that I stand for. And shortly afterwards is when I actually dropped out <laughs> of school. Um, and that was one of, you know, I'm not surprised. Yeah. There was financial, you know, I was, I was broke, so I, I couldn't continue school, but a big aspect of it was just recognizing that going to church and being in that environment was so not good for my soul because I'm like, I'm feeling so upset, so angry every time I go, this is not what someone should feel like when they go to church, you know? And yeah. I just don't even want to be around this environment where like, there's this hatred, you know, I could just yeah. feel the hatred ebbing and flowing um, within the church every time people talked about it. It's one of the reasons why I am so obviously outspoken against the church is I, I feel like you're kind of told that there's one right way to leave. And the only way you'll kind of still be accepted after you leave the church is by being totally silent. Mm -hmm. And that anyone who even says, posts one thing on the internet or posts a, a nuanced article or maybe says something in conversation, you get labeled as an anti-Mormon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting that they, it's coined as anti-Mormon and a, not anti-Mormonism yeah. because I feel like I am very, I am anti-Mormonism because mm -hmm. anti -Mor like Mormonism is homophobic mm -hmm. and it has a really sexist past, a racist past. Yeah. Like, of course I'm anti-Mormonism because I find a lot of things about the doctrine very awful and troubling mm -hmm. and concerning and bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Mormons, I, I, I wouldn't ever say I'm anti-Mormon. My family is, are Mormons. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's about, it's learning to like criticize the organization and not the, the people who are in it, who often are as drinking the Kool-Aid as yeah. I once was. And I feel like I think of myself being homophobic mm -hmm. as a Mormon because I was believing what I was taught and that all those people who are still in it, I think are people who could become like me mm -hmm. with, with logic and reason and compassion. And I think that that's why it's, it's so difficult to criticize the church because it really turns people's minds off. Yeah. Completely. You know? I mean, even the way that like anti Mormon is referred to, it's not even you know, media content literature that is aggressively criticizing the church. It's any type of just critical lens towards the religion yeah. is viewed as like anti-Mormon. I remember, oh, this, you're bringing back so many memories. I love this. I remember the moment that I realized the church was not true because I think for so much of my life, I was like, Okay, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. I really don't like that. But, you know, the church is true. So I, I guess I'll just have a passive approach to those things. I remember being in the kitchen with my sibling talking to my mom about why we weren't able to say attend another church or why we weren't able to um, read another um, churches or religions uh, literature. Because I think at that time, like I expressed interest in um, reading about other religions. It was something along those lines. And I remember my mom was so against it. Both my parents were so against it. And we both asked her, like, if the church is true, why is reading 
any other type of spiritual literature or anything else against what the church believes. And she said, no, like in order to be a good Mormon, in order to have a testimony, you can't read any of that. You can't look into any of that. And I remember my younger sibling looking at it. We looked at each other and mm-hmm. we both just had this light bulb moment. The knowing like, look. Yeah. Yeah. It was such a telepathic moment, honestly, where we were like, whoa, okay. If, if that is true, then there's no way that this church is true because if you can't even read any, any other spiritual works, let alone critical media about the church in yeah. general, then how, how can it stand? Yeah. It's very eye opening to see even like the, the, the talk doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith mm. was a common phrase that was used when I was leaving and was said to me, which is that it's better to question your questions and think to yourself that, you know, I also remember people talking about how if it makes you feel badly about the church, then it's from Satan or it's not inspired by God. And so that's how, you know, you're reading something that's false because the Lord would never give you a bad feeling about the church. Mm -hmm. So if you read something that inspires a bad feeling, then that's not from God, Mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy because if you, you know, there's so much that you can read about the church. That's obviously unfavorable, obviously going to make your testimony potentially Mm -hmm. be questioned. But if you can even plant the seed that questioning itself is a sign that you're not good enough or you're not holy enough or questioning is a sign of Satan getting a hold of your mind that that's such a, I mean, how that's like seven layers deep of how hard it is to mentally jump out of Mormonism because you're not even allowed to have doubts. You're supposed to doubt your doubts. (laughs) Just like crazy. The cognitive dissonance (laughs) is so wild. And I've always felt that like any true religion you know, reading criticism about it or seeing criticism about it. And, you know, the doctrine will be able to withstand that. You know, I feel any type of, you know, organization or religion that I think is good to be a part of, you can see criticisms of and be able to logically and objectively identify how it's not, you know, that's not true or that's not totally accurate. Um, And so that's what I've always felt like so confused with with Mormonism is like, the focus on don't expose yourself to anything else. Yes, only it's like focus on what you're, the church says. you're told to be truth seeking, mm-hmm. but there's only one truth to seek. <laughs> and yeah. you hear this story about Joseph Smith and none of the churches were true. He gets to go in the woods. He gets to pray which of all of these is true. That if, if, if an active Mormon youth tried to have the same experience, mm-hmm. go into the woods and pray, then if there was some answer he got that was not that Mormonism is correct, mm-hmm. then he would be told he was not hearing God speak. Yeah. And so the the thing that Joseph Smith was allowed to have in his questioning and truth seeking is not permitted to have to the members of the church he founded. Yep. Yep. I remember when I was in high school, I kind of did my own version, I guess, of like Joseph Smith's search for truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had the aberrations and everything in front of me. No, <laughs> um, no I went... Uh, I had a really close friend who was um, Catholic and I remember, you know, seeing her pray her rosary and I was like, that's so cool. Like, I really want to try that. I started praying the rosary, fell in love with it. Now, looking back, I fell in love with the more meditative aspects of it rather than like the religious aspects. But I remember being like, wow, this is something I'm so interested in. I would really love to, you know, like go to church with her. I asked my parents and you would have thought that I murdered someone. It was so bad. Like, they were so upset, just like for weeks, just did not want to talk to me. We're just so. Were you allowed to still it. have that friend? Like my parents probably would have been like, we can't, yeah. we don't want to really be friends with that person. Yeah. Anymore. So I wasn't, we still like hung out in secret at school, but I wasn't allowed to like go over to her house anymore. You know, all that because, you know, she, for some reason was, you know, satanic influence on me. And, you know, I, I remember in that moment thinking too, like, okay, th- isn't this what exactly what Joseph Smith did, you know, attended other church churches, yeah. tried to find out what was true, prayed about it. I remember being so earnest and just um, transparent with my parents where I'm like, look, like I'll still go to Mormon church. I'll still believe in Mormon doctrine. I just want to experience another faith and, you know, just see what it's like. And there was absolutely no tolerance for that, which was yet another sign to me that like, 
okay, this is indoctrination and only allowing for one perspective and one, you know, life only, which is true died in the wool Mormonism. And that's it. Um, which, you know, of course, pushed me even further away. Yeah. I, um, I feel like my family was kind of the opposite in that we were allowed to go to other churches, oh, okay. but usually it was a ploy <laughs> To get my friend to then come to my oh, church. Okay. <laughs> Proselyting. <laughs> Where it was like, well, if you go to, if I go to your church, you should come to my church. So I had some, I had friends throughout my childhood who would end up coming to my church because they would be evangelizing to me and I would be evangelizing to them. Mm -hmm. And I even got up once at, I think it was a Baptist church. I got up cause it was kind of a testimony meeting, kind of a similar thing. Mm -hmm. And I got up and I bore my Mormon testimony about how, well, all churches have some truth, mm -hmm. but my church has the most yes. truth. <laughs> I remember and, that always being said. Yeah. I'm sure the, the, the like adults in the room were just like, like, who let this Who's girl this in? Girl? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who invited her? She doesn't even go here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, wow, that's crazy. So yeah. how did you break the news to your family, to your parents, mm. your family? If you don't mind. Yeah, no, all good. Yeah, now. it was kind of in segments. Which well, we should say, your name is Hiram. Yeah, if that doesn't, isn't a glaring sign that's out not of race Mormon. very obvious that your family was ultra devout. Yeah. Like Hiram is a very Mormon name. You know what though? I am so grateful for it because branding wise, it helped my career so much. Social media, it was great. Nobody's ever heard of a Hiram before. So I was like, yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I, thank you, mom and dad. I don't know. <laughs> I made a, a video about Mormon names mm -hmm. and I mentioned Hiram mm -hmm. and I had many people comment like, does this mean Hiram from YouTube is Mormon? And I was like, that's so funny. The like, way that so yes, many people it does. <laughs> truly do think I'm Mormon solely because of my name. I saw uh, like a hate Reddit post the other day um, where they were talking about my skincare brand and someone was like, I refuse to support a skincare brand that, you know, is donating 10% of its profits to the Mormon church. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm like, if you watch any of my content, you will know if you I'm only so not knew. Mormon. But anyway, um, yeah, very, you know, Mormon name. Um, and the way that I was able to break it to my parents was kind of in segments almost. Um, I initially, I wanted to be very honest with my parents about not going on a mission because, um, you know, my siblings had, my older siblings had said that they were going to, um, but wanted to go to college first and then kind of like broke the news afterwards that they weren't going to go on a mission. Um, and my parents, you know, initially had been willing Which to- Which number are you? I am the fourth out of five. Okay. Yeah, so, so you have so Mormon did family. four people not go on missions? Or? Um, so it was just my oldest sister, but my okay. two older brothers um, did not. Okay, and um, you know my parents had said, "Oh, we'll financially support you throughout college, like you know, pay for your housing, uh, help pay for your tuition, um, if you're going to go on a mission." Very common. Very common. I mean, that's that is so common. I happen all the time at BYU where the parent another carrot. <laughs> Carrot being dangled, the parents will pay for college, but only if a mission is served first. So it's another another little <laughs> manipulation tactic, which when you're a Mormon kid, you're like, oh, like, that's so nice mm -hmm. that you'll pay for my college and I want to serve a mission anyways. But in hindsight, it's like, that's very messed very up. Very manipulative. Yes, exactly. And, you know, with what happened to my older brothers, you know, like saying they were going to, going to go on a mission, go to college, but then not end up going out on a mission. I'm sure it wasn't malicious, but you know, for me, I was like, you know what? I just want to be honest with my parents and just tell them like, look, I have no interest in going on a mission. That's not what I want to do, um, which was very scary. And of course, immediately financially cut off immediately. I'm kind of surprised it wasn't was it kicked a, out, but- a phone call? No, so okay, this so was- Okay, so you said it was before you were in college. Yes, yeah, so okay. this was like when I was graduating from high school, like, two months before I graduated, okay. somewhere around there. Um, and I, you know, wanted to tell them because I had plans to move out of the house pretty much immediately after I graduated. And so that was kind of like their first sign that like, I wasn't really vibing with the church. Um, and I didn't say to them like, I don't wanna be Mormon anymore. I said what I needed to, to survive and still have a home yeah. that I could live in, to be honest. Um, and so I was like, you know, I, I don't wanna go on a mission. I'm not totally closed off to it, like maybe down the road, but like, that's not something I want from me right now, but I'm still going to be Mormon, you know, just 
Really and you went trying. to BYU Hawaii, which is obviously seems like you're still trying to yes. show I, you know, I'm going to a church school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I think in their mind, the reason why they weren't as harsh as they could have been is because they're like, well, he's going to be at BYU Hawaii. He's going to be in a very religious environment. He'll probably be inspired to go on a mission once he goes there. Um, once I came to BYU Hawaii and realized that the world is much bigger than my tiny, tiny, very Mormon, you know, town. Um, that's when, you know, I was able to fully not only grapple with my not wanting to be Mormon at all, but also being gay too. And so, um, after that, I'd say it was, how long ago is this now? Seven years ago. I, um, told my parent, I came out to my parents and also came out of Mormonism, you know, of saying like, yeah, it's like, usually okay, I feel like I both at once. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Package deal, you know, uh, <laughs> both together. Um, and you know, uh, at that point was when I was essentially disowned by my parents for that. Yeah. So I haven't had communication with them since at all. Really? Um, yeah. Not even in like a call on Christmas or I mean, I get notes and let I used to, I don't, I don't anymore. I used to get notes and letters from my parents just re-emphasizing that I was on a sinful path, that, you know, I was lost in the darkness and to come back to the light and lots of Bible verses and Book of Mormon verses and all that kind of stuff. Um, No apology, which is really all that. (laughs) Yeah, I was hoping you were like, oh, the letters are like, hope you're okay. Yeah, no, 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 you know, um, and I'm very grateful that that's not a super common experience. I think a lot of like, um, gay Mormons, you know, when they come out to their parents, initially, it's very, very bad. But nine times out of 10, the stories that I've heard is that the parents come around and they're like, you know what, we'd rather have our kid in our life versus yeah. not. Um, that's unfortunately not not the case for I'm me. Um, it's okay. You know, chosen family is the best thing that I've ever discovered, you know, yeah. not having to deal with the very toxic tethered relationship to be honest um and not having to be tied to that has liberated me in so many ways and i think it just goes to show that like how deep the doctrine really runs with people yeah. because i i want to genuinely believe that if my parents didn't cling to mormonism in the way that they did i feel like in other ways they were pretty open-minded you know they would have been accepting but because they were so committed to that doctrine that's just no yeah it's kind of crazy else. that a religion can put that wedge between a parent and a child. I mean, what relationship is supposed to be closer than a parent and a child? And it's like, I feel like it's like you said, I think in most stories I've heard, usually it's not full disownment. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a mix. I think a lot of times now I'm seeing parents leave with the kids, Mm -hmm. which to me is such a, an amazing thing to celebrate i think that's similar to basically what happened to david archuleta Uh, his mom left with around the same time as him Mm -hmm. so i think sometimes i think the church is getting better but then like we were talking about before we started recording there's doc or policies that they implement like they just changed the policy around trans people how 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 they can be involved on what levels they can be involved there's a whole list that's i think in the new handbook or whatever and people will celebrate all of these oh there's you know people are being more nuanced you know we're Mm -hmm. we're a loving religion Mm -hmm. uh but then they as soon as they take one step forward it seems like it's really is two steps back and it's just as kind of it's like repackaged homophobia it's like they'll lead with we're gonna be respectful and we're gonna be kind and then if but if you read the fine print it's like they can't work with children yeah literally (laughs) they can't work with children at all like need to talk to their bishop about like which bathroom they use you know like all these the, the fine print always just re-emphasizes the homophobia and transphobia, um, which, you know, LDS Church, geniuses at marketing, they're always, you know, very good at, like, presenting to be one way, um, you know, very accepting to LGBT individuals. But in reality, the core doctrine remains the same. And so long as that core doctrine is there, people are going to cling on to their bigotry, you know, in the, in the same way that they have, or be put in the position where a lot of, you know, parents and people are leaving. I also grew up in a time that was basically pre, we both did pre gay marriage legalization. Mm -hmm. So I think I grew up around non-members, but I think 
we lived, our whole adolescence was still at a time where it was super taboo to be gay. Yep, yep. I don't, I can't think of one kid in my high school. I didn't go to a Mormon high school. I went to, in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any gay kids. Mm -hmm. And you know they were there. Oh, they're all closeted. <laughs> yeah, but they, you know they were there. there. <laughs> um, but it, it was kind of, I mean, now it's such a different landscape in a school, mm -hmm. you know, where people being gay is pretty normalized, depending on your, you know, where you are in the country. And so I feel like I didn't really meet gay people till I was an adult. Mm -hmm. And I met gay people, you know, I didn't meet gay people who were out of oh, the closet. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you realize basically immediately that you, you're the bigoted one. Mm -hmm. Like as the person who's saying they shouldn't be able to get married. I mean, I remember a girl at BYU crying, basically expressing she was gonna be celibate her whole life. And oh, just the psychological yeah. impact of saying, I will never have the romantic touch of another human being yep. ever. <laughs> yep. And then like, hopefully God is going to cure me. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> she probably wouldn't even know I was in that class. It was a, like a mm -hmm. class of 50 people, but I, I hope, you know, wherever she is that she's not still believing because mm -hmm. it's such a damaging self belief to have to participate in Mormonism while being gay. It's so painful. There's this subgroup, you know, subculture of gay Mormons, you know, um, and I always look at that group with like sympathy um, because it's just so isolated. It's like it's so lonely. In the same way that we said like Mormonism can come between parent and child, it really also just becomes, it comes between you and you. Mm -hmm. Like the you, the real you, and the idealized Mormon you. And I think it's crazy that people would rather cling to Mormonism and have a life of celibacy mm -hmm. than, or like go off and marry, a, a, get married heterosexually. Mm -hmm. They'd rather do that than leave behind the Book of Mormon, which is a totally made up book. <laughs> like it's all made up. I mean, it's like, if you're gonna sacrifice, sacrifice for something good, you know? I, I, mean, I do think there are a lot of gay Mormons though, or even just Mormons in general, who can recognize the, um, false aspects of the doctrine, but are only stay because of the community, because of the family, because of like who they're surrounded with. I, I think there's more than, you know, the church would definitely like to admit because that is the hard part. And that's, I know for, for me, the terrifying, the terrifying aspect of it was, you know, I, I had to move out of that environment to get away from that. You know, even though I was going to BYU Hawaii, I still, you know, felt the need to completely escape that environment, to be able to surround myself with like a total reset. Think, yeah. A total reset. Because I knew that if I were to, you know, like fully leave the church in that environment, I would lose absolutely everything, you know, yeah. everything would be lost. And I think a lot of people remain in the church or in straight relationships or whatever it may be for that reason as well, which is just so heartbreaking that the church really does wrap itself. So, tightly around yeah. individuals. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've heard so many stories of people who are, you know, 35 and they've never dated anyone. They've, they've, they've tried to be celibate for mm -hmm. 35, 45. They've, they've, you know, years and they've done, you know, conversion therapy, mm -hmm. anything that the church has, they've done counseling with the bishop. Yep. And it's, it really is, I think, so sad. And I, I mean, I think the church does provide a community. Um, I think it can be really scary to leave your community. I'm really interested to hear from you, like how long it kind of took to, like once you left the church to kind of unlearn so much of this that had been still, I mean, to be honest, I personally believe it's a lifelong journey because yeah. even if your behaviors don't mimic what you were taught in the church, it's getting rid of that just shame and constant guilt that you feel that is instilled in you for from such an early age but like how long would you say it took before you know you were like comfortable drinking coffee and drinking wine and uh yeah. wearing you know immodest, immodest clothing, clothing. <laughs> it is funny i feel like every person has a different meter for different things mm. so i was pretty quick to try coffee we tried coffee within the first few months of leaving mm. i think after trying coffee maybe it was a couple weeks later we tried beer and wine oh, okay so it's so pretty, it pretty quick yeah. um i actually like got way too drunk like a few nights like basically within a week of trying alcohol for the first time we i like totally was drunk throwing up 
So it was like, I bet that awful. hangover was like, this Sing. is God's sign to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Every ex word has to go through that. I'm I know. Hangover feeling like the I feel like Lord's manifestation that you're. Most now. people have that experience when they're like late high school, early college, mm-hmm. where they're blackout drunk and they're like, that was not a good idea. Mm-hmm. But ex Mormons have to do it when they're like, in their 30s or 40s yeah, when they yeah. have like kids and they're like oh my god like it's a, it's a lot to try to figure out and yeah. you can really feel like your life could go off the rails really easily and i think for some people it kind of does, it does because yeah. you never see responsible use mirrored you know like we, most people grow up seeing their parents drink mm-hmm. and so you might like you see what their coffee order is you see how much they consume you yeah. see Maybe they're drinking more on the weekends, but tomorrow's work. So I'm not like you just see so many things kind of shown to you when you're growing up in the secular world. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's really delayed development. The normal development that we go through as adolescents, it's really delayed for that. Combine that with the complete loss of self that can come with leaving the church that combination yeah, can messy. just be chaotic. You know? And it's really sad. I think people are so, so underprepared for the real world. And then adding on top of that, like you said, the loss of identity and the tailspin of having maybe your parents mm-hmm. be really disappointed in you or facing potentially divorce. Some people get divorced because of this. You know, it's really just a spiral that I think it's one of the reasons people stay. And I think it's one of the reasons I wrote my book, Shameless P- Plug, like how to, how to leave the Mormon church, because I feel like l- learning how to, how to have coffee mm-hmm. sounds like it should be easy, but a lot of people leave and they, they won't try it for five to 10 years mm-hmm. because they're so intimidated. It's not like they don't want to, it's because they're so intimidated by the idea of stepping foot. You know, it's, mental agony to try to just like go through a Starbucks line. Yeah. Yeah. Just the, the constant internalized shame. And I'm glad you're able to like do that relatively quickly because it's once you do those things that you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, you know, this, I'm, I'm not burning. I'm fine. You know, it like, took me like five, five, six years though to wear a bikini. Like really? me, for me, it was modesty. Okay. Oh, like interesting. I still wore, like, if you look at pictures of me, after leaving for the first few years, Mm -hmm. I'm still wearing garment approved clothing because I just was like, I just felt so, you know, my first tank top in public, I literally felt just naked, (laughs) you know? Uh Yep. Yep. Um, So that took me much longer. And so it's interesting that there's all these little buckets of what Mormonism teaches you Mm -hmm. that some people go full speed ahead in one bucket. Some people, you know, maybe they're they're even gay and they're ready to drink, but then five years later, they're ready to download an app, a dating app. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think all, all of these different taboos are all in these different buckets and you might be ready to jump in on one, but so afraid in another. And it's really, it takes so long, like you said, a lifetime, I think, yeah. to kind of unwind. And sometimes when I feel like I'm around members of the church, I even still just revert back to just like, Oh yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. like I feel so, I can feel so self-conscious and so bad about myself. Uh, it's eat, intense. You know. Oh my gosh. Like I remember like relatively recently revisiting, cause I still live in Hawaii, um, revisiting, you know, BYU Hawaii campus. And immediately the way that I was like, Oh, my pierced ears. Oh my gosh. What am I wearing? You know, my dyed I hair. So you know? gay. Yeah. I'm just like, Oh my God, I look like such a homo. Oh, like, you know, the instant insecurity and just thinking, feeling, even though I had been, out of that environment and out of the church for so long, it really like, that's how deep it goes. And it does, yeah. in my opinion, take a lifetime um, to unlearn. And for me personally, a lot of therapy <laughs> to <Yes>. unlearn, <laughs> um, you know, all Agreed. the teachings. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in high school, grappling mm-hmm. with my, you know, um, ide- sexual identity, as well as, um, well, I guess not sexual identity, sexual attraction, mm-hmm. as well as my relationship to the church. Um, I was struggling with very intense eating disorder, uh, mm-hmm. anorexia. And uh, thankfully, my parents recognized in seeing how bad it was that I did need help. But of course, they were like, you are going to a Mormon therapist only. And I went to either one or two sessions. I don't know. It, <laughs> it was very short because immediately... I could tell that the primary objective of this therapist was to only reiterate 
what church doctrine is and that I w- it was not a safe space whatsoever. So I was just like, oh, you know, I'm fine. I'm magically healed after this one therapy like- session. This was so amazing. And I never like saw him again because good. <laughs> I just think it's so un- unethical. Um, yeah, which happen. for context, the church has its whole, it, an entire therapy department, which I think I don't think I've ever talked about how there are marriage and family therapists that are in the Mormon network. There are people who a lot of times I think they're doing coaching instead of therapy or they have like a specific faith based therapy. And even there, I think maybe pre pandemic, maybe 2019, Utah was trying to pass this anti-conversion therapy law Mm. and the church got really involved with trying to ensure that religious therapy could be separate from conversion therapy, basically allowing the Mormon therapist to still engage in conversion therapy tactics under the guise of religious therapy by law. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is a whole a whole thing, a whole back and forth. And I'm pretty sure that the church probably got their way because in Utah, the church always Always. gets their way. Yep, Yep. the the, the funding and the (laughs) social support (laughs) is crazy politically there. I mean, I'm glad you're able to like get out of that environment because I know like uh, it took me a long time before I was actually comfortable going into therapy um, because my experience was so negative uh, and feeling that like everything was so influenced by the church. So after you left BYU Hawaii, what like what did you do? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It was a really like kind of like horrifying moment for me a little bit because I had to drop out of um, BYU Hawaii um, because I couldn't afford it. Um, Also, I was just so done with the church at that point. I felt like it was not making me a happy, kind, loving person because every day I was just like, this is making me so mad. Um, And so I dropped out and immediately got a job as a makeup artist. Um, That's something I was- Did you already know how to do makeup? Yeah, and (laughs) that's something I kind of want to talk about in the video that we're doing together on my channel, um, where we talk about beauty standards and in the church and that whole perspective. But I started- I will, like I said, Hiram's channel is linked below. We're gonna drop our videos on the same day. So finish this video. Once you're finished, hop on over to Hiram's video because we're doing a collab on both sides. So yes, yes, it's gonna be super fun. I'm excited. Um, but yeah, I actually started, you know, like um, doing makeup when I was at BYU Hawaii. I was like really interested and passionate about it, and something I had to like kind of sneak and hide, you know, t- so that I would avoid any judgment. Um, and I was able to land a job as a makeup artist, and uh, that's where I really started to become passionate about cosmetics and saw a huge gap of knowledge and education when it came to like ingredients and self-care and how it works and you know what what products you should be using um and really gained a passion for that which Um, is so cool like i mean what a such a 180 yeah i mean you're like kind of trying to be straight at BYU, a Mormon <laughs> university trying to pass a straight, and then you go, you leave, you get a job. Oh, honey, nobody thought it was straight at BYU. <laughs> they were blind. The, the closet was glass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it really was like a very dramatic 180, but I think yeah. that's a testament to just how over it I really was, yeah. you know? And yeah, I mean, it's just, I, I think that's really cool though, and shows like how brave you were to be able to not just fall like we were talking about earlier where a lot of ex-mormons fall into this deep despair Mm -hmm. after losing their family after leaving the church so it's cool that you kind of immediately were ready to pick up the pieces and start your start this different life that was unlike anything like living in a small town in arizona Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know i think honestly once i lost my family as horrible of a situation that was i think in my mind i was like you know what I really have nothing left to lose. You know, like I've been fighting for this for so long in order to keep this connection with my family. And now that the, that's no longer here, I just felt so much more free to be able to like fully express myself. And, um, and also I think because I didn't have like a super strong testimony and I hadn't gone on a mission, I had been able to build a identity that was separate from the church. So I think I knew myself well enough coming out of BYU to be like, no, I know who I am. I know what I stand for. I know what my values are. And I know that I can do things that are not so-called approved by the church and still feel a strong sense of self, which I'm so grateful for. And yeah, and um, as I was working as a makeup artist um, and then I started working as a skincare specialist, 
um, and really recognize that like, wow, there's really nothing online or very limited knowledge online about skincare. What if, what if I were to just like create a YouTube channel just, just for fun. Um, and yeah, that's when I, I started to, to see growth. Even one of my first videos actually was about like growing up gay and Mormon. Really? Talking a little bit about my story. Okay. Which I'll link scary. that below too. I don't think I've seen that. <laughs> oh, no. it's a super old video. I think okay. that was like 2018, 2019. Okay. I'm going to go watch it after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like my first very public coming out, I guess, you know, and I definitely felt a sense of freedom online and also community in a weird way that I felt I never got to have when I was in the church. Mm -hmm. I definitely felt that sense of community online, um, seeing the support from people, seeing the incredible comments and the stories that people were sharing. Um, and Which I do feel, I love, I feel like the ex-Mormon community is really stellar. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are really so understanding, so loving. Yeah. I feel like I was posting on the ex-Mormon subreddit constantly when mm -hmm. I was first leaving. How do I navigate this and that? Everybody's always giving the most, you know, even active Mormons will go on and post and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And people will say, if you want a faithful response, here's some ideas. Wow. And people will be like That's pretty, cool. pretty. they're very compassionate because mm -hmm. I feel like Mormons are, are who are questioning and leaving are very frail and fragile yep, yep. and like in a very scary place. So I and we've feel all like gone through that like process of like the initial, like, Oh, I still, you know, like want to be a part. Yes. I want to love the church all the way down to like where we are. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just we heathens, understand the full just <laughs> normal heathens. <laughs> You'll get there eventually, yeah. but you need to be talked down. Basically. Yes. Everybody needs like a mourning period. It's like the mm -hmm. seven stages of grief or what is it? Six stages. I don't even know how many stages yeah, there some, are. Some number like Whatever that, number there are, we've been through them all at this yeah. point, but initially you're really needing, I think some love and support. So mm -hmm. it's really cool that your, hopefully your video attracted those types yeah, of people. Yeah, it was incredible. And it was so cool. I remember when I posted my Game Mormon video, um, people from my small town reaching out who were, you know, youth group leaders or Sunday school teachers, um, just expressing like how sorry they were for anything that they could have said or anything that would That's have, great. you know, made me feel worse about myself. It, it was like the coolest experience ever. And aside from that, from a skincare perspective, you know, being able to build that community and feel that sense of like inclusion, mm -hmm. um, was something that I had never really gotten to experience before. And it was so magical. And yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, tr going from hiding your makeup at BYU mm -hmm. to being ultra public, that's a bit, very different, yeah, <laughs> different yeah. world to <laughs> enter into. So it was definitely scary. Um, as I'm sure you can relate to, you know, when you first, I, I can't even imagine the fear I would have making videos like you, like it, it's so brave of you to be able to do that. And when you're first doing it, you're just like, you feel like the whole world is watching. And as I always like to say, you realize very quickly, nobody's watching. So you may as well <laughs> post whatever the hell you want to. And, um, and, <laughs> and then, know. you know, being able to see the growth from it, it's just been such a magical, incredible journey. Very cool. Yeah. yeah my first, um, my first video about garments where I showed them, mm. my hands were shaking <laughs> and it's so crazy. You know, like we've been talking about, I, I haven't worn garments for eight years. I do not believe in garments. Mm -hmm. I think they're just fabric, you know, but still they, these things have such a strong psychological yeah. hold on us. And it's not even like I was nervous to, to be putting it online because I had obviously already made the choice that I wanted mm -hmm. to make this video. It was just that I was anxious at the idea that I'm showing the garments. Yeah. Like I would have been shaking too if, if strangers had been in the room and it wasn't for online. It was just, and of course I already can hear people commenting me like, the reason you felt like that is because you were feeling the spirit. <laughs> No. no need to comment. Then. No, you know, no offense, but we're scared of the people who are commenting. But yeah. We're scared of you guys. The great thing is, is usually people who would comment that don't make it this far into the video. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's good. That's good. I, I mean, I even told you off camera, I think that was actually like the first video I came across of yours. Okay. And even me as a viewer, very much not in the church. 
I remember like clutching my pearls a little bit and being like, oh my gosh, she's so brave. Whoa, <laughs> this is like really intense, you know, because there is such a almost stigma around. That. Yeah. And even so many ex-Mormon content creators talk about so many subjects, but many don't, many, many choose not to talk about the temple, which I totally think is valid. I think yeah. everybody should make the content that they believe in, you know, no, no shame to anyone who doesn't talk about the temple very expressly and specifically, but I feel like for me, that was such a huge part of my questioning of the church and almost the the damage that the church did to me in, in having to experience the temple ceremony and wear garments every day and hate it, hate it, hate it, like what you're describing. And so to not talk about it to me feels like being a bit deceptive because it feels like it was so central to what I like le how I, how I decided to leave the church, how I struggled with the church while I was in it. And so, yeah, I think, I think pushing publish on those videos can be oh very intimidating, but so I, incredibly like brave of you and seriously, yeah, like props you. to you. I think the growth that you're experiencing is so warranted and you're, it, you're so deserving of it because it really takes a lot of balls <laughs> to post what you're posting and to talk about <laughs> it so you. freely. But um, it's been, even for me, like, you know, I feel like you're actually kind of like the first, you and Zelf on the Shelf are the only channels that I've like watched. Cause I think from my perspective after leaving the church is like, look, the church took so many years of my life away from me. I don't even want to think about it anymore. True, I don't so want true. it to occupy my life, you know, but I get so inspired watching your videos because I'm like, not only is, you know, do, do I see that bravery that you have, the information that you're providing genuinely blows my mind. The Joseph Smith series you're doing, guys, Thank you need you. to watch it. It's incredible. Literally mind blowing even years after the fact where I'm like, wow, this is crazy, yeah. you know? So the work that you're doing is so impactful. I think it's incredible and seriously props to well, you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for saying I have the balls to get it done. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, um, I think too, an element that I see come up in comments a lot is people who leave the church before experiencing the temple ceremony mm -hmm. feel like they kind of missed out on something because it's so held up as this amazing, beautiful, wonderful, transcendent experience, but no one will ever talk to you about it. So if you leave before you go through the temple, I think a lot of people are just curious, what is this thing that they never got to, to see and experience? And they, they, it's like this piece of the puzzle they never got to mm -hmm. put into place. And even if they leave, they're still like yearning almost for what it was that they weren't worthy enough to participate in mm -hmm. when then they see it and they're like, well, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Literally me, literally me, because I, I wouldn't necessarily say I felt like I missed out, but I always was genuinely curious. curious. And then yeah. once I started, you know, like only very recently, to be honest, like watching videos about it, I'm like, I'm so glad I did not, <laughs> did not experience that because, whoa, that yeah. is actually crazy. And crazy yeah. that I served a mission and I was wearing garments and participating in the temple ceremony in the prayer circle. I'm participating in what is, in my opinion, a very culty ceremony. And I never told one person who I helped get baptized into the church about that truth. Mm -hmm. And that to me is such a deceptive aspect of converting people to Mormonism mm -hmm. is that they don't get to know that that's what they're agreeing to be a part of by getting baptized. That that's what's at the heart of Mormonism is the temple. It's not really Jesus or yeah. Jesus is in the temple, but like the, the temple is what's what you're supposed to achieve as an, a new member of the church. So for my converts, my dream for them would have been, you know, for them to go to the temple. Mm -hmm. But I you're not allowed to say anything. You're not supposed to secret, not say or sacred, not secret, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is they say. So <laughs> I think that that's another reason I feel really passionate about making the temple videos, mm -hmm. because I think anyone who's going to potentially join the church and give 10% of their income yes. and deserves so much of their life deserves to know that that is what they're going to be participating in. And 
So I just think it's important to talk about. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Oh my gosh. I love, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> I think it's incredible. And most, uh, thank you so much for even having me on. And yes, able to, like, thank share you. share my story and talk about this. I'm so glad it worked out. We're, we're just in a random hotel room in Austin. I know, you're literally the only reason I come to Austin, so. <laughs> the sun is going down. <laughs> yes. Um, and I, if you want to check out Hiram, I definitely suggest uh, we're going to do our video after this. Yes. He's going to uh, give me an analysis of this whole situation. <laughs> I do get a lot of comments on my makeup and my skin and then my mm. image, which, you know, that's part of being a woman online, I guess, yeah. is lots of opinions. Yes. Oh, so, uh, but we're also <laughs> going to talk about Mormon beauty standards, Mormon kind of culture of perfectionism. So definitely check that out. Thank you again to Hiram for coming Thank on. You. And as always, I will see you all next week. Bye, guys. One final huge thank you to MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. I 100% recommend checking out MyHeritage to learn your ethnicity estimate, get your DNA matches, and so much more. Find it in the link below.